The Honorable Justices of the Supreme Court of the State of Iowa. Hear ye, hear ye. The Honorable Supreme Court of the State of Iowa is now in session. Thank you. Please be seated. And good afternoon. Welcome. We have uh, three cases that will be submitted this afternoon. Those cases are Metropolitan Property and Casualty Insurance Company versus Auto Owners Mutual Insurance. Second case is United Electrical Radio and Machine Workers of America versus Iowa Public Employment Relations Board in the state of Iowa. And the third case is State of Iowa versus Antone Tyree Williams. That last case is now submitted to the court without an oral argument and we will hear the arguments in Metropolitan Property. Mr. Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. Matthew Nelson on behalf of Auto Owners Insurance Company. At the heart of this appeal is the question of whether auto, auto owners insured Parker House Properties LLC face any significant liability for the death of Hunter True? If the answer to that question is negative, then the questions of whether there's coverage and whether contribution was proper here go away, and the settlement between MetLife and Parker House was not reasonable or prudent. For that reason, I intend to focus this afternoon on issues of liability and not of coverage. The key issue, I believe, in, that's presented in this appeal is whether a family owned passive land holding company is liable for the personal activities of the family on company owned property. The district court recognized that this question pitted the Lala family in their personal capacity against the Lalas as owners of, the, of Parker House. But the district court erred by concluding that this ambiguity should be, or that this, this dispute should be resolved in favor of assuming that everything the Lala family did uh, was for the benefit of Parker House. The district court's ruling that Parker House has faced liability on principles of agency and premises liability are both misplaced. And I'd like to start with agency uh, and then turn to premises liability. Under Iowa law, for agency to exist, there must be consent by the principal uh, for an agent to act on the principal's behalf and subject to the principal's control. And then the agent, too, must consent to the same. The district court here based its ruling, its agency ruling, on the facts that Jay and Lori Lala allowed their son Nick to go to the property uh, if he told them that he was going there and uh, told him to lock up after, after himself. Um, they also ensured that their son uh, had taken gun safety and knew about the proper care of uh, a firearm, specifically knew that um, you shouldn't, of course, uh, leave a, a gun loaded um, and cocked. Um, that, that should not happen. You know, what's our standard re review? This is a, we're reviewing a judgment from a, on a bench trial. Is agency typically a question of fact? Your Honor, agency would typically be a question of fact. I think here the facts of this case make it are, such, are so one directional that it is effectively a question of law. Uh, the question of the underlying question of law is, of course, whether or not the, um, the, the settlement here was reasonable and prudent. Uh, so that would be, uh, ultimately, I'm, at the end of the day, I'm not asking this court to, um, to change the district courts or to object to the district courts' um, conclusions as to what the facts are, but rather what the legal import of those facts are uh, with regard to agency. And specifically here, the only fact that would suggest um, that there was, uh, the only fact that would suggest that Parker House was involved in any of this whatsoever is the fact that Parker House, as a property holding company, owned the land. All of the other actions uh, are consistent with the family's own understanding that they were using it for their own personal uses, uh, for recreational purposes, and uh, they did, they, they handled this accordingly. So when the directions were given by um, Jay and Lori Lala to their son, make sure you lock it up when you leave, let us know when you go out there. They were doing that as parents. They weren't doing that on, on behalf of Parker House and there's no evidence in the record that uh, Jay and Lori Lala thought 
that they were doing that as Parker House managers, or that uh, Nick and his brother Sam thought that when they received those, it was just the same as when, when Nick and Sam would leave the house uh, and mom, mom and dad said, hey, let us know where you're going. What, what about premises liability? Because, the, I mean, Parker House is, a, is the named insured, and under premises liability theory, that could be a dangerous condition on the property, and then you've got expert testimony from lawyers or even a former chief justice, uh, that there was exposure there, dangerous condition, and then, of course, it led to a fatal accident. Uh, was that a question of fact that we're now bound by the trial court's uh, um, fact finding that there was liability exposure on a premises liability theory. And again, Your Honor, I would submit that the question here is that is under these facts, can there be uh, legal premises liability for this particular accident, specifically given the fact that there were at least two intervening negligent acts by, um, by the, the, the Lala sons, the two boys. Um, the specific problem here with regard to the premises liability is if the two boys are not acting as agents, and I would submit that they were not acting as agents, they were just acting as members of the family. Um, if they weren't acting as agents, then as to, as to Parker House, uh, the two were invitees. Um, and not for the pur I'm not saying that for the purposes of making any distinction based on their, their status, but just to say they were invited onto the property. And this court has said in Ludman that uh, the court is going to apply the restatement third of torts and it's interesting, the um, a brother counsel uh, refers to the anhydrous ammonia um, illustration under, com under comment H. If you read two comments, uh, two illustrations later, there's a shooting example, specifically an example where the individual, um, uh, the, a, a young person invites another friend over, the friend brings a pellet gun and ends up inadvertently shooting uh, a passerby. The only difference uh, that in, in then says there's no premises liability in that context. I would submit that but for the fact that the gun was resting on the bed on this property for the course of three to four months, uh, that that's this case. Because the boys who left the gun, the boy who left the gun and potentially the same boy who picked it up and negligently swung it across his body and allowed it to discharge in the direction of his friend. Uh, were not acting as, as agents, they were acting as invitees, uh, just like um, I think the boy's name in the illustration is Tony, just like Tony in the illustration. Uh, well, so the um, did Metropolitan to view this at 900,000 as a, as a reasonable settlement for the case, and I, granted they're buying peace on the, the personal liability uh, of the parties as well as the Parker House. But for a death case, 900000 for the death of a 17-year-old healthy boy, that's looking at damages. If you assume liability, that's very reasonable, isn't it? Your Honor, we, have no, we, we do not contest the reasonableness of the overall settlement, uh, just the reasonableness of the allocation here of effectively 50% of it on a premises liability theory where uh, the premises, uh, under the factors this court has adopted, I don't, frankly think there's any significant likelihood of premises liability in the first place. Yeah, but your opposing counsel had two experts, at, two lawyer experts at trial that disagreed. Isn't this a, what we have trials for? Your Honor, the two experts disagreed and the court made the, the uh, identified a, the problem with the expert testimony and that is that they were essentially saying, um, I think this is how strong the legal argument is uh, versus the others who said, I don't think the legal argument is terribly strong. And, um, and not surprisingly, uh, the experts for auto owners said the legal argument wasn't very strong, and the experts on the other side said that it was very, fairly strong. So I don't know that the, the fact that the, it wasn't a situation where the parties were contesting the amount um, of overall liability, and they were pointing to other jury verdicts or other verdicts from courts and addressing something that was, that was truly factual. This was a legal analysis, and then uh, I would submit a gestalt gut feel reaction um, perhaps if the, uh, the, the, attorneys, uh, the attorney experts had come in and suggested something other than the one saying it's t entirely not reasonable and the other one saying that it was uh, the, the entirely justified specifically where it was, there might be, uh, there might be some more discussion there. But that, that wasn't how this happened. You have, a, you have two experts who essentially provided their legal opinions. Um, Is there at least a jury question that it's, it's negligent to leave a, a, 
a rifle, a loaded rifle um, on, on a bed um, in a place where other people may be coming and going? Your Honor, I, I certainly I think there's at least a, a jury question, although I, one might even say that that is, um, uh, that there, there's no question that that would be a, a negligent act. The question here is, is that negligent act imputed back to the passive land holding company who wasn't, in, who wasn't exercising control over the property at the time? The it, I'm not sure I agree with that. It wouldn't, Park, Parker House own, owned it, right? So Parker House owned it, but the but restatement now is focused, has changed the, the Well, aren't focus. they also the possessor of it? Your Honor, I would submit in this case that, that no, they're not actually acting as the possessor of the property. The, the family here is using it for residential purposes. They're using it for their personal use. They're not using it for a purpose uh, of the business. The business is, is a, pa it's a passive investment right. holding. W was it bought as an, as an investment property or was that one of the reasons? That's the stated reason for the acquisition was that it was an investment property. And as an investment property, um, Parker House um, effectively ceded the possession and use of the property to the family. Did, so, did the, the dentist, uh, did Jay uh, occasionally use it for, for business purposes, having his, uh, his patients come out for, or, or other, uh, other, other business or community related activities that would be deemed Parker House? He occasionally used it for, for business activities, but I don't believe, Your Honor, that they ought to be deemed Parker House's activities. The, the, bu the, ac the business activity was the business activity of the dental practice. And the same, in the same way that if I have um, the staff over from my law firm to a party at my house or at, um, or, or at uh, some other property I might own, I'm doing it in my personal capacity or, or in my capacity as a, as a business owner, but not as the owner of the particular, not as the owner of Parker House for, the, for Parker House's investment purposes. At the end of the day, Your Honor, I would submit that the situation in, in I've, we've scoured the, uh, the case law to see if we could find a similar situation where you have a, a family owned passive holding company that's been held liable on a premises liability theory. Uh, and we haven't found cases either way. I think that makes this case somewhat unique. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, here you have a situation, if the restatement third of torts is going to uh, shift the, uh, the idea here to a general duty of care, and I think that's appropriate, um, then the issue is, well, who has the duty of care? And the duty of care, according to the, th the restatement third now, is with the land possessor. And you can certainly have multiple land possessors, but then the question is, what the, the duty of care has to be based on the level of control that they're exercising. And here the family as the family was exercising, if not all of the control, almost all of the control, and the company was, was not exercising control at all. It had ceded the property over. Uh, if this was a typical, uh, I would submit the family was effectively the tenant in this situation. And if, the f if this was a typical landlord-tenant situation, if this sort of thing had happened, I don't think we would be here discussing whether what, or not What the kind of policy would cover this liability? Did he need a personal policy? He had a personal policy that covered this liability. Right. Did he need another one or I, I, I don't mean, for more for, for more coverage, I guess I would say. Well, for additional coverage, he could either increase the policy line that he had or, or acquire an umbrella policy, I suppose, but he had insurance coverage for this risk uh, and it covered his risk. Um, the question the, the policy that's at issue here was a commercial general liability policy for the proper, for the passive property holding company that had actually activities at what other properties. The, what was the business of the company? What was the business of Parker House? Yeah, that would that would maybe reach the commercial policy. So uh, the other business, the other properties that were uh, also held by Parker House included the uh, apartments above the dental practice, uh, the dental practice building, uh, and I believe there was another apartment building. So those other properties had uh, a very specific commercial use that would have been insured by this policy. It's not as though acquiring this policy is meaningless uh, with regard to, uh, uh, to Parker House. So if a tenant at one of the rental properties um, tripped on um, a loose step on the staircase, they knew about it, they, there's a lawsuit, you'd cover it. Yes, if there was a if there was a if there was a loose step, absolutely. If the um, if, however, the same facts as this had occurred, where the tenant left the uh, the firearm sitting out, and then there was subsequently an injury, it wouldn't be covered by the the. Um
But if it was, let's say, there was a, a security guard that was there to protect the premises and left that gun there, in that case, you know, operating for the realty company, then you're saying you would be covered. There, there would arguably co be coverage there. That, I mean, assuming the facts just as you set them out, yes. It's a little bit blurry um, factually because you've got the land, who's the tenant, who's the landlord. The uh, landlord, okay, Parker House owns it, but uh, its managers and it and the owner of that entity are are the, you, you know, Jay and his wife. I'm just coming back to isn't this a, a question of fact? The trial court resolved against your client. Your Honor, I, the. At the end of the day, the, all of the evidence demonstrates that the use of the property was exclusively personal and none of it was for the benefit of Parker House. They never thought of themselves as acting uh, as Parker House. Uh, and so at the end of the day, we're left with a situation where premises liability is imposed simply by the act of ownership. And the restatement third in its discussion of land possessor has moved away from that. And so I would submit that the uh, the situation here is not so ambiguous as the district court thought it was. Unless anyone has further questions, thank you. Mr. Nelson, thank you. Mr. Jones, you may present your argument. Michael Jones on behalf of Metropolitan, may it please the court, counsel. In attempting to avoid paying the judgment against its insured, Auto Owners has made a variety of arguments, but its arguments are contradicted by its policy language, by the testimony of its underwriting supervisor, its claims manager, its insured, and its insurance agent. In addition, each of the four issues that auto owners have stated in its brief to this court are at odds with existing Iowa law. The first issue that auto owners have submitted to this court asked the court to grant the motion for summary judgment that it filed back in 2015. That request is directly at odds with this court's 2009 ruling in Lindsay v. Cottingham and Butler. I understand that, but w what about, um, you know, we just heard nearly 15 minutes of, of uh, argument on the uh, question whether Parker House, the entity, had any premises liability exposure. Um, did it? Yes, it did, Your Honor. Obviously, it's undisputed in this case, and auto owners puts right in its brief, that Parker House Properties owns the property where this accident occurred. And that distinguishes the case from if this shooting had occurred at the Lala home in Mason City, which was titled to Jay and Lori Lala individually. It distinguishes the case from if it, the shooting had occurred at a public park. Here we have a situation where this shooting took place at property undisputedly owned by Parker House Properties, which gives rise to clear duties on behalf of Parker House Properties to maintain the premises, to inspect the premises, to make dangerous conditions either worn or make safe. And in this case, we have a loaded rifle that's cocked, that no safety is on. That's a dangerous condition. I don't think any, I don't think auto owners even argues that that's not a dangerous condition. So we have a dangerous condition and we also have this period of time where the rifle was sitting out on a piece of furniture. And I think that significantly implicates the duty of Parker House Properties and proves that it breached its duty and clearly that breach of duty was a cause what of how long. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. What was the evidence that they would have discovered that? or should have discovered that. I mean, in a premise liability case, it has to be there for a reasonable period of time for someone to discover it who's on the property. What was the evidence of that? The evidence was that on the day that the gun was left on the bed, which was at least two months prior to the date of the shooting, the Jay Lala, 
the owner of Parker House Properties was on the property that day. So in other words, you have this situation where the loaded gun is laid on the bed at a time where it was Jay Lala who actually was there, who actually was the one that locked up the house at the end of the day. And Jay Lala was there again on April 22nd, the day of the shooting. He left 15 minutes before the shooting uh, took place and actually told uh, Nick to lock up the property. So we have this process and, and the district court, I think uh, uh, at page 11 of its ruling, which is on the appendix on page 292, writes, the proper securing of the home and guns are duties related to the conduct of maintaining the premises. Now in its brief, Auto Owners doesn't even dispute that. Auto Owners doesn't dispute this idea that when it comes to securing the weapons in that house at the end of that day, whether it's two or three months before the shooting or on the day of the shooting, is a duty that belongs to the owner of the property. Which they, again, they do brief the, the um, distinction between an owner and the possessor of real estate. Is it fair here, or, or should we, or can we distinguish between uh, Jay Lala, um, half owner of the entity, versus Jay Lala, the tenant? I mean, because we do have cases that the responsibility for uh, um, premises liability shifts to a tenant if they have control of the property. Is that what we have here? Your Honor, I would uh, submit that the issue of who is the possessor of this land has not even been preserved for appeal in this case. It was not something that was ruled on by the district court either in its ruling in November of 2017. It was not an issue raised by auto owners in its motion to enlarge the judgment. It was not an issue that was made by auto owners in its brief in this case. It first appears in the record as part of the reply brief that auto owners filed in this case. Let me, let me ask this question. If I read your, what you passed out today, and it's part of the insurance policy, so I don't look it up, thank God. But it says the insured, is they list the insured's bow. Each insured they list, but it says, but only with respect to the conduct of business. I mean, what's the conduct of business going on there that, that would cause this policy to, to kick in? The conduct of Parker House Properties is the ownership of land. And so what you have is Parker House Properties bought this land, titled it in the name of Parker House Properties, and maintains the property during the course of the many years that Parker House Properties owned this Floyd County uh, property. It, it sold some parcels, it actually added to uh, some of the parcels. It sold the parcel, the parcel to farmland, uh, part of it was sold uh, for a profit. So it, it holds this as the, the owner of uh, the real estate. But what was the conduct of business the day of the shooting? Well, the conduct uh, of the business on the day of the shooting, and, and one thing I would like to point out, Your Honor, is that when auto owners wrote this policy, as the district court held in, in its ruling, Auto owners knew there was no active business operation at this location. And we see that reflected in the fact that the entire time that auto owners wrote this policy, it rated this location as vacant land. It knew there wasn't a dental practice being operated at that location. It knew there wasn't an apartment building at that location. And still it charged $125 a year for a million dollars worth of coverage for this Floyd County location. And there was also an umbrella that covered this location. If there's really no exposure to Parker House properties from owning this location, why does it even well, have you, the coverage? Do you agree that, that um, ownership in and of itself is not enough? I would say that ownership in and of itself creates a duty on behalf of the landowner to, to make the property safe and including inspecting the property for, uh, for uh, a dangerous condition. So it's take enough to give rise to a duty. Take this hypothetical. Say we had a, a the, one of the apartment buildings had a swimming pool in it and the, the owners, the, the, the Parkers, whatever their name is, they say, 
they let their sons and their friends go swim in the swimming pool, even though they're not tenants or anything. And they go to the swimming pool and there's, there's not a safety line or some other negligence in maintaining the pool and one of the kids die. How is that in the conduct of the business? I mean, would that be covered under this policy? Well, I think, uh, yeah, yeah, let's say it's a swimming pool and some kid, neighbor kid, four-year-old kid, comes over and, and falls in the swimming pool and drowns. And there's, there's no fence around the swimming pool. Yes, I believe in But then you've got attractive nuisance, you've got other doctrines, and th that's even gone under the restatement. But what if, what if they said permission, you, you, son, you could take all your friends there and do anything you want there and go swimming. How is that in the conduct of business? Well, there would have to be a particular fault that ties it back to the owner of the property. In other words, the duty is not enough to ultimately impose liability on the property owner. There has to be breach, there has to be cause, there has to be damages too. So, you know, just because there's a duty of the property owner doesn't necessarily mean a breach. But I think in this case, there is evidence not only of the duty, but also of the breach. And if I may give an example. Let me ask one other question. If, if this was the conduct of business, why would the personal policy pay? Because it was titled to Parker House Properties. The personal policy does not cover commercial entities. And that's actually in the record. That was actually confirmed by the agent who wrote the policy that he, he could not put the coverage for Parker House Properties on the uh, Metropolitan Policy. That that, that coverage uh, belongs to, to the corporate entity and you don't insure the corporation on the homeowner's policy. Hey, I've got a coverage question on how to read this policy. Uh, Justice Wiggins had questions about the, the limitation to conduct of the business. Does that only apply to the individual manager, for example? But I don't, I don't see that, uh, but only if in the conduct of business applying to Parker House as an entity. Correct. I think that's absolutely correct. Okay. And that's why we don't see policy, or we don't see cases like this because I think the coverage is crystal clear. I think the coverage, when you look at the policy and the who is an insured section of the policy, which auto owners put, if you look at a, a, a sole proprietorship, it's gotta be in the conduct of a business. It says they're right in black and white. If it's a limited liability co company, you are an insured, no conduct of a business. Now that's what, Auto Owners is trying to take the conduct of a, of a business language and put it in this first sentence of subpart C of the who is an insured endorsement, and it's simply not there. And I think the ramifications of that, Your Honor, is that this policy provides coverage for Parker, excuse me, for, for Parker House properties for any liability it has of any nature, liability of any nature, Unless there is something else in the policy, but does it that make any difference it? that a limited liability corporation can only act through its managers and members? Correct. Correct. So, how does that impact your argument? It impacts my argument because, as the district court found, the process of maintaining and securing weapons that were stored at this location, these guns were kept, these rifles were kept at that house for an extended period of time. Dr. Lala, as a member, um, if he's engaged in personal activities, doesn't, his conduct does not give rise to liability to the limited liability corporation yeah. or company. And, and I think an example of that is if we look at it in the non-premises liability uh, context. For example, let's say Dr. Lala is off hunting with some buddies and it's not on property owned by Parker, and he accidentally shoots one of his friends. Okay, then you might have a question of whether that's in the conduct of a business. But the key here is that this happened on property owned by Parker House Properties. So we get back to the basic question. It comes down to ownership. Is that how liability hinges on ownership then? I think that gives rise to the duty. I think under Iowa law, and we look at the restatement, third of tort, section 51, which clearly puts a lot of duties on behalf of the owner of the property, including the, the duty to inspect and make safe, that's not on Jay Lala individually. That's on Parker House Properties by virtue of the fact that it owns the real estate. And, and I really think the argument of auto owners calls into question, I, I, I mean, living in liability companies are, 
authorized by Iowa law. Chapter, Iowa Code Chapter 489 provides for limited liability companies. And what's unique about limited liability companies? The term limited liability. As individuals, you have unlimited liability. And so what the state of Iowa has allowed, as many states have, it's a uniform law, have allowed people to put assets into a limited liability company and, and allowed them then not to have unlimited personal liability. The position taken by auto owners actually creates a gap. The LALAs then have a gap because auto owners has actually stated its position in a, in a brief it filed two months before the in Metropolitan, auto owners stated in one of its pleadings uh, in, in, in the district court that Parker House may in fact have liability to Metropolitan, but that does not mean that auto owners has to pay for it. See, they abandoned their insured. They, they created this, this gap in coverage where Parker House properties would not have any coverage under the auto owner's policy or under the Metropolitan policy, and that is not the intent of the policies. The intent of the agent, the intent of the lawless, the intent of this policy is that the coverage that uh, auto or that Parker House Properties purchased for this location, for any obligation it has arising as the owner of the property, is going to be covered by this by this uh, policy. Was there a common liability between um, Metropolitan and and auto owners? If if uh, uh, Metropolitan doesn't insure Parker House and and auto owners is, is only on the hook, arguably, uh, through a premises liability. F uh, f so do we have the, the elements we need for contribution? I, I see that my time is up. May I answer the question? Your Honor, I'm glad you raised that because I think one of the uh, unfortunate aspects of auto owners brief is I think they have absolutely butchered the application of Iowa Code Section 668.5 in their argument by this argument that you that they, they have to be the same, that in order to contribution, we have to have the, the same insured, and that simply is not the way that 668.5 works. And I think any, any doubt, if this had been just a case of metropolitan against auto owners, maybe we, there'd be some, uh, you know, maybe we could argue about that. But here we have Parker House Properties actually assigning its rights in the auto owner's policy to Metropolitan. And I believe on the basis of that red giant settlement that this idea that Metropolitan has no claim against uh, auto owners is, is simply wrong. Thank you. Mr. Jones, thank you as well. Mr. Nelson, you may present your rebuttal. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Justice Waterman, in response to your question with regard to contribution, um, I don't know whether the brief was butchered. Uh, I can tell you, however, that there is no contribution claim directly between Metro or Met MetLife and auto owners here because they don't have the same insureds. But there is a contribution claim between um, the, the LALAs in their personal capacity who were insureds under MetLife's policy and against Parker House, that contribution claim was settled. And then the assignment of, of Parker House's indemnification rights to MetLife gave MetLife the claim against auto owners. So there is no contribution claim directly here because they, they weren't the same insureds. But ultimately we get there. Uh, with regard to, very briefly, with regard to the comment about um, land possessors or, uh, being addressed in the reply brief, I would submit that the argument generally was made uh, throughout the opening brief, but without referring to the land possessors, which came up because in the Appellee's brief for the first time, correctly, but for the first time, um, MetLife raised the third restatement of torts. And then in response to that, uh, in addressing how the third restatement of torts applies to this case, uh, my client auto owners addressed uh, the land possessor issue and so thus it's like the exception uh, with regard to the reply brief rule in State versus Carroll. I want to go back, however, 
uh, to I think what is the most important issue with regard to premises liability, this idea that mere ownership results in premises liability. That's not what the Restatement Third says. In fact, if you look at Restatement Third, uh, Section 49, Comment B, it specifically says that it's using the term land possessor as opposed to owner to clarify the fact that where possession has been given over to a tenant, for example, and the tenant is exercising control, that the landowner doesn't have uh, that same control. It, the restatement further allows that you can have more than one land possessor, and then the corollary to that is the obligations of each land possessor are attendant to the amount of control that they're exercising. Here, Parker House Properties, as, we've argued, uh, as I argued earlier, was not exercising control. Rather, the Lalas were doing that in their personal capacity. Uh, thus, uh, the suggestion that mere ownership results in premises liability is incorrect. Finally, I wanted to address the issue of uh, the characterization of what was happening here as maintaining and securing the property. Uh, if one generalizes facts to a sufficient level, I think one can probably squeeze it into just about any liability framework, and I think that's what's happening here. The specific, to the extent that there was an agency relationship, uh, and we don't think there was, but to the extent that there was, and, and Nick Lala was acting in the scope of it, it was to lock up the house. That was the direction. In the course of locking up the house, he turned off and picked up this gun because it was lying on the bed. And the record's clear about that. Uh, Nick Lala testified, I wasn't picking it up for any particular purpose other than the fact it was just lying there. Just like when you go to Cabela's and you see a gun and you want to pick it up. He's a 17-year-old kid. Uh, he picked up the gun. Uh, he unfortunately did so negligently. He swung it across his body and it went off. That is not maintaining and securing the property. That's outside the scope of any agency that would be there. Um, and so that's too broad. Um, at the same time, if the mere act of maintaining and securing property and there being some benefit back to the company is sufficient to impose premises liability, then every time a tenant locks the door of their house, turns off the water, or does other things that could potentially be viewed as maintaining the value of the landlord's property, there's somehow liability back for the landlord. And I can't point you to a specific case, but I would say that just can't be the law. Landlord liability cannot be that broad. What, was, what risks were, were covered when um, auto owners pro, uh, issued this policy and added the, um, the vacant land or what it thought was vacant land? Um, what, can you give an example of, of a case where the the policy would have paid out? Uh, well, certainly, Your Honor, if um, in the course of this, if the situation had been instead that Parker House Properties truly was exercising control, if they were leasing out this property uh, to other, uh, other folks and they came across a hazard uh, and that happened, if um, the Lalas um, brought in a surveyor uh, for the purposes of determining what the exact boundaries were, uh, of the property that Parker House held for Parker House's benefit, and that person happened across uh, some sort of uh, hidden defect or, or something that resulted in an injury. In those sorts of contexts, there would be, uh, there would be coverage. But in the, the context here, where control is being exercised by the Lalas uh, effectively as tenants, uh, then it's not Parker House's liability. Unless anyone has further questions, I see my time is just about up. Thank you for your, for your time this afternoon. Mr. Nelson, thank you as well, and Mr. Jones, thank you again. The case of uh, Metropolitan Property and Casualty Insurance Company versus Auto Owners Mutual Insurance is now then submitted to the court, and we'll next hear the arguments in United Electrical.